Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. You know, sometimes in a story when the rubber has to meet the road, it happens in a really fascinating way that you'd never really expect. And if you're within the sound of my voice, that must mean you're in the seats with once more. As always, my name is Dave Voigt, and I'm the host of this podcast, and uh, where we sit down with a wide-ranging variety of industry professionals, and we pick their brain about current projects, state of the industry, how they got started, and so very much more in a light and conversational fashion. And if you like how we do things around here, I'm going to go out on a limb and say that you do, because you're listening right now. Uh, you can subscribe to the podcast. You can find us over at Apple, Amazon, Spotify, Google. It's all good. And plus, we archive every single one of our episodes over at our In The Seats YouTube channel. So if you can give us a like and subscribe there, we'd really appreciate it. Also, you can find us over at the social media, as the kids call it. We're on the Facebook, which it may end up be calling. They're calling it at some point. Uh, Twitter and the Instagram, or IG, as the kids say. Uh, for all sorts of updates at either at In The Seats or at It's Podcast One. And finally, and I feel like a broken record because I say it all the time, please visit us over at In The Seats, intheseats.ca for all the latest and greatest from the world of film, television, the moving image, and beyond. On this episode, we're, we're going south of the border. We're going to the Austin Film Festival for the world premiere of a brand new film called Spaghetti Junction, and I cannot tell you how much I love this film. It is really a confluence of genres and styles that come together in a in a fantastically fascinating way. And it's, uh, like I said, it is playing the Austin Film Festival down in the States. It is available online if you're not in Austin, but it is the feature film debut from uh, Kirby McClure, and it's this really beautiful and atmospheric film that takes us to this neighborhood called Spaghetti Junction outside of Atlanta, Georgia, where the crisscrossing freeways interweave and bring in together an unexpected intersection of people. It's, it's a really interesting look at a young woman who is recovering from grief, but also recovering from a recent injury. She is an amputee, and sort of trying to find yourself and find yourself in really uh, well in a unique way I mean it's it's a weird this whole film is a weird collision of uh, you know under the skin and Project Florida it's it's uh, Florida Project excuse me but it's a fantastic film and we got the the unique pleasure of sitting down not just with Kirby but we talked with a uh, star of the film Kate Hughes who is just fantastic in it and it is her debut feature as well which is even more impressive uh, young actor Tyler Rainey and actor Cameron McCarg, I hope I pronounced that correctly, just about their experiences on shooting the film and so very much more. But just a reminder, it is uh, having its world premiere at the Austin Film Festival uh, this, uh, this weekend even. So check it out if you are uh, an American listener down there or just check it out when you finally find it because... Spaghetti Junction is a fantastic little film that absolutely deserves to be seen. But at first, enjoy our talk with uh, the director and cast of Spaghetti Junction because it's a good one. And even do that before you see it on Saturday, October 23rd at the Austin Film Festival, be it online or in person. But support indie cinema because that's what we do here and uh, hope you enjoy our talk because it's a good one. All right. Well, obviously, first off, just thank you, everybody, for the time today. I really appreciate it. And, and congratulations on the film. Thank you. I guess, yeah. I guess, Kirby, my first question is for you. Walk me through sort of the inspiration for the story, because it really is uh, an interesting mishmash of, uh, of styles. You've blended two very distinct genres here and put them together. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think, um, you know, for the film, it's... Um, if, if we were to look at just a, you know, a recently amputated teenager or, you know, a disabled teenager and what she's experiencing in her waking life uh, with the family troubles and her family sort of adjusting and trying to recover from this tragic uh, car accident that's happened in her life where she lost her leg and her mother and how her older sister and how her dad are sort of um, coping and trying to escape. She has her own escape as well. And it's through this kind of more fantastical um, experience she's having. So I think um, for me, you know, the the more um, 
the, the genre kind of mixing, like you, like you said, I think it comes from trying to get more into her psychological state and not just what's happening on the surface, but what's happening in her head. Because to me, that's the only way to really get to the essence of what she's experiencing. And, and I think hopefully that makes it more um, authentic in a way when you're in her head and you can see the way she's seeing the world and what her fantasies are and what her um, beliefs and escapes and all these things are. Um, so yeah, and then also inspired by the uh, the setting of Spaghetti Junction, which is this, uh, you know, crisscrossing of different freeways that all come together in this area, just about 20 miles outside of Atlanta, where um, it's this sort of, um, it, you know, corner where not only are these freeways crisscrossing, it's also people from all different parts of the world um, and, um, you know, working class people and immigrants and people from all, all walks of life all coming together. Um, and then it's also this kind of overgrown um, uh, place where you have like factories and things that have been abandoned that used to be here years ago. And now it's just sort of run down, but the people are still holding it together. And there's a lot of really interesting cultures that mish and mash here. And in our film, obviously it's also symbolic of these uh, interconnections between these different characters that meet, you know, not only from the earth, potentially, there's also this kind of supernatural entity played by Tyler who um, all intersect in this one moment in time in this teenage girl's life where she needs, uh, you know, maybe she needs some support or some escapes from the world. Um, so, yeah. Can you talk a little bit about the visual flair for the film too, because I absolutely loved it. It really created this environment that, it didn't feel like it was specifically anywhere. We were sort of in this bubble of this universe and it was this very sort of small but sort of unique shell that we were living in. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so my cinematographer, Christian Zuniga, and I, we kind of created this, you know, visual Bible of um, different aesthetics that we would use for the house and for the way we photograph the landscape where, you know, in this part of uh, the South, everything's kind of over, especially in the summertime, like overgrown with kudzu. So you have these like, uh, you know, strange overgrown buildings. And then you've got these trucks and motorcycles and exhaust uh, that's always there. But then you've also got these more magical, idyllic kind of things like, you know, fireflies that are twinkling at night and stuff uh, and beautiful sunsets mixed with the smog and trucks and things. Um, I was calling it like a, a dirty South Ohm because you've got the like hum of the trucks that's this kind of omnipresent thing in the film, which creates this sort of unsettling kind of ominous, undercurrent that's happening even you know so there's like there's scenes where it's you know the dad in august and they're just eating a grilled cheese sandwich together but because of this like you know hum of the freeway out there it sort of adds this undercurrent that hopefully feels like there's something bigger happening you know outside of this little kitchen table um so uh yeah that's a, a lot of different ideas that came together to, to create this now i mean there are so many distinct characters in this film and i mean cam it, it feels like almost you're the one playing it straight. You're the one sort of the emotional core of the film. I'm kind of curious, what was it about uh, this script that sort of attracted you to be a part of this? Well, yeah, well, first of all, I, I agree with, you know, when you're talking about blending these sort of different genres together, that was one of the things that stood up to me the most in this experience, because, you know, I'm kind of this salt of the earth, uh, you know, guy in this sort of kitchen sink family drama. That's, that was my part of it. And, uh, you know, it really blew my mind when, cause in the, in the last scene, I don't want to, you know, spoiler alert, but I got to see the other fantasy aspect sure, of it yeah. in the warehouse. And I was just like, what the, f it just seemed like such two different, two completely different things. And Kirby kind of, uh, uh, isolated me from that in a way. Um, yeah. Intentionally. What, yeah. Yeah. He, yeah. So it was, I, I was just so stunned. It was really a, a jarring thing to see, uh, this, completely and it was really impressive like it really honestly for for i mean kirby really swung for the fences here and this is an independent film and i was i was like wow he's i mean it was so ambitious i, I was wondering is this gonna work you know and it, yeah it, it, i'm sorry i'm sorry i got a little hopefully hopefully tried. it but, works so yeah. what were you saying about, what was your question about the holding it together well just in terms of it feels like you're the one who has to play it straight with all these other characters who are going through all this stuff you are the guy in the kitchen sick drama that it felt right. almost it felt it almost felt like you were a grounding element to the entire story because obviously you were separate from what was going on till the very end yeah i think that's true i mean that's uh that's kirby's doing more than mine but yeah, yeah, I think that is true. And there was, there was just some elements of, uh, you know, there'd be obviously little hints of this other, uh, this fantasy world with the, uh, the flowers or with that, uh, that uh, purple, sparkly yeah. space <laughs> material, whatever that was, you know, 
um, right. kind of crossing paths. It was, you know, I, I, mean, I couldn't help but think of it as sort of a, um, a uh, like a Pan's Labyrinth in, in the working class South, like Pan's Labyrinth and right, right. Project. Kind of I like, like yeah, I like that. Yeah. I like that. Um, I'll take so, that. So, yeah, yeah. I, I guess, I mean, Kirby, maybe you could speak to that, but I think that's probably true. I was probably sort of the grounding rod. Uh, yeah, in, absolutely. You know, I think, um, you know, like I said, it's, it's, I wanted to both look at her waking life and her subconscious. So, you know, there is the kitchen, kitchen sink drama that's, that's unfolding of the dad trying to hold it together. He's, you know, he's going through things in his life. Um, and then she is too. There, it's a family trying to cope with the loss of their mother and with the loss of, you know, her leg. So it's, uh, that's a very grounded story. Um, tragic, but, you know, uh, on the earth. But then it's what's going on in her head creates these fantasies. And I feel like, you know, over the course of the film, it starts off much more grounded. And then as things progress, it sort of spirals into a more and more kind of surrealistic and fantastical kind of uh, story, you know, as things go on. And she kind of surrenders into the fantasy um, because she wants it. She wants an escape from this life she's in where things are, you know, kind of brutal in her waking life. So she needs this escape and all of the characters have an escape. And I think all of us do in our, in our lives, you know, too. But I think like you look at dad, he's got his escape through drugs and alcohol. You've got Jesse and, and shiny who are escaping with each other. And they're literally trying to escape the town. They're doing something to raise money to escape the town. They escape through their, their car with the lights and the drum and bass, crazy music and that kind of thing. And then, um, and then August escapes through this romantic, kind of fantasy that literally is from, you know, potentially another world. We, we don't know if it's in her head or not, I hope, but um, yeah. So a lot of different things to explore. No, I mean, Kate, I, you were absolutely fantastic in this and I loved your performance, but I mean, I was kind of amazed to, to find out that this was your first, uh, your first job, your first feature. Can you walk me through, I guess, just getting the job, but also sort of the experience of, having to sort of carry this emotional weight on you for an entire feature, which I can imagine be is an interesting experience when it's your first uh, acting gig. Yeah, definitely. Um, well, it's kind of a funny story how I found out about the part. Um, Kirby, when he was looking for amputees, he contacted all sorts of places that work with amputees and the place where I get my prosthetics is called a step ahead. He contacted them and they posted on their Facebook that they were there was looking for amputee actors and my mom sent it to me and she's like, do you want to audition for this? And I was like, sure, why not? Um, I had never done anything like it before, but I thought that's such a cool opportunity. I feel like I would kick myself if I didn't go out for it. Um, and I absolutely loved it. I loved the whole filming process and getting to see how movies were made. And um, But I, I do think my favorite part was figuring out August and figuring out what made her tick. Um, and kind of working through her emotions and um, what she was feeling. And um, what I will say what really helped to deal with the um, her emotions and all that was just working with the other actors with Cam and Tyler and Jesse and Eleanor because, um, you know, she's feeling all these things, but she's reacting to everything and she's putting her emotions into Tyler and into this being. And um, she's trying to work through it with him while trying to take care of her dad and um I was living in the house that we shot at as August's house I was living there when I came down to stay there and so that also really helped to get into her mindset because I was kind of living and breathing as her um yeah yeah I think it was important too because what you know the casting process to find August took place over the course of almost an entire year um, and, and like Kate said, you know, I was reaching out to amputee clinics and camps for disabled kids and children's hospitals and all these places trying to find, you know, August. And um, it's almost like I was starting to give up by the end. Because, you know, there, there had been producers and people I had spoke with who said, you know, we can make this film and we can probably get a, at least a, a slightly working budget if, if we were to get a kind of up and coming actor or an actor with a name to attach to the film. And then we can always paint her leg out and post if it's important to you that she's an amputee. But to me, it was, you know, completely out of the question to do that. I wanted the authenticity. So it, I, you know, but I set this kind of challenge for myself because then because of that, it took almost a year of casting. And, and I was almost about to give up and say, you know, maybe I just need to write another film or something because this project, I'll, I'll wait until the right person pops up. But then Kate got in touch 
and she sent me the audition, you know, she sent me a tape of this one particular scene. Um, and it almost gave me, you know, or in fact I was, I, I became teary eyed almost immediately watching it. Like, Oh my God, that, that's her, you know, that, that's what I've been looking for. So I jumped on a plane and went and met her and her mom in, in New York, like two weeks later and discussed the role and everything. But, um, but then it was important to sort of take Kate who lives in Queens, New York, and bring her down to Doraville, Georgia, you know, in this rural slash industrial sort of area. And kind of, and like Kate said, you know, she lived in the house where we shot for, you know, several weeks before we started shooting just to kind of immerse herself in this world and immerse herself in the character. Um, so it was important to kind of bring her into this atmosphere of, of what the film is. Well, and I mean, something that I really loved about the film is that, I mean, while obviously August is an amputee, and you're being very faithful to that it wasn't necessarily a gimmick or a prop it was just it was very much about who august was as a per person and i mean for both of you how important was it to have that kind of portrayal just be up there and not be as like quote unquote the gimmick or to lean on it to be sort of different or accepted or that kind of thing but just have this very sort of unique character who also happens to be an amputee for sure yeah i mean i think it was important to um it wasn't a film about an amputee. It right. just happened to be a girl right. who was an amputee and Kate can speak to it, you know, but there was a lot of things that she brought to the script um, and through um, talking with different, you know, consultants who sort of gave me ideas, but, you know, Kate read the script and she would feedback about uh, this is maybe could be different. This could be like this. There's, there's a, a scene where she wakes up in the middle of the night when uh, something's happening outside of her house and she wakes up and she goes to look out the window and she just collapses on the ground because you know, as a character, she would have lived 16 years with two legs, but then in the middle of the night, when you're sort of let your guard down, you know, she wakes up and, and this was something that was a reoccurring theme that came up from different people I spoke with who had, who had lost a limb is, you know, when you're in a vulnerable moment or sort of not fully awake, you can sometimes um, do that kind of thing. Um, but Kate was super amazing with, with kind of feeding back on the script and, and giving me so many ideas along the way that made it a better film without a doubt. For me, I definitely think that having August be a three-dimensional character, mm. that was super important for me, um, especially just because, you know, you, there are not a lot of amputees on screen. And um, so having a good, accurate, and um, faithful portrayal of an amputee, not just as, like, just an amputee, she's so much more than her leg, um, was really important to me when I was reading the script. And that's one of the reasons why I absolutely loved it. And August and, my, August and mine's experiences are a little bit different because like Kirby was saying, she's a recent amputee where I've been an amputee my whole life. Um, there are themes that are very, very general and um, for amputees across the board that um, are so present in the film and like kind of that uh, omnipresence of it. Yeah. Fantastic. Now, I mean, Tyler, for you, just when you when you make your appearance, I mean, obviously, if you, you feel like a little bit of the wild card in this sort of scenario. But at the same time, it almost feels like Kirby gave you maybe the most rope to play with the character. And I'm kind of curious, like, walk me through sort of how you got involved and how you sort of found uh, your traveler. Yeah, well, getting back to, you know, saying what Cam said, it's like when I watched the film, I I saw the like the dichotomy of like how it kind of just transpired where as you said like you have this kitchen sink drama going on but at the same time you just have this just this thing you know because a lot of times you're, you're like okay yeah like all this is going on with the family you know august sister is running away but then at the same time you have this being this guy who has face tattoos who whose eyes are literally the galaxy and trying to embody that it was also trying to be somebody who kind of knew everything, but also didn't know anything at the same time. And I really just tried to live in that, you know, kind of really weird thing of like, oh, I know everything, but I'm also learning everything at the same time. So that really just, and I, and I do appreciate Kirby giving me, as you said, a lot of rope to play with, because I guess getting back to the Pan's Labyrinth thing is like, I try to, you know, make it seem like, okay, is this real? Like, this is so out of what's going on. Like, is this actually happening? Like, is this actually what August is going through? Or is this more of like her imagination? So uh, yeah, fun time, fun time. <laughs> yeah, that, that's interesting what you said too about um, knowing everything and also being 
knowing nothing. It's like, you know, it is this sort of um, spiritual kind of being where he feels time, you know, it's like he feels the future and he feels the past, but yet he's kind of floating above it. You know, he's, he's, he's not involved uh, in, in the present because he's already seen the present or something like this. So it's, um, I think it adds to that sort of ethereal aspect of his character um, that Tyler was able to bring to it is, you know, he's, he's ethereal. I didn't want him to feel yeah. so grounded. He wanted to be this, this kind of magical thing, which helps kind of um, be sort of a, a, a misdirect in a good way of, of trying to say like, is he real? Is he this kid that we're seeing on these news broadcasts as this missing kid or is he an alien or is he a spirit or is he, is it just completely in her imagination? But um, yeah, we, that was definitely something we uh, tried to uh, dial in as much as possible. Now, I guess for all of you, because I'm curious, because obviously this is a film that from both ends of the spectrum borrows from other films and other stories that have had come before it, but it doesn't. It still feels different and sort of above and separate from it. When you're doing something like this, do you, do you reference other work or is it just a question of you have to try to come in with as clean a slate as humanly possible? Yeah, it was pretty natural. Um, you know, I, I definitely have inspirations right. uh, that, that, that run deep in me that are probably just part of almost like, you know, I can't help but be inspired by them. I could write something and try to be as original as possible, but we're all kind of drawing from- well, Of course, yeah. The pools, you know, but, but I think, you know, films like um, uh, Man Who Fell to Earth with David yeah. Bowie, you know, there's this alien character who's functioning on the earth and there's these romantic situations happening, but yet he's an alien. And that was a huge inspiration. Um, and I have a man who fell to earth poster in my living room that I sort of look at daily to kind of remind myself of, you know, what inspires me. Um, but then, you know, at the same time, I'll, I'm really inspired by Sean Baker and his films like Tangerine and the right. Florida Project. Yeah. And I love that sort of uh, naturalism and, and looking at, um, you know, families and trying to capture something that feels really uh, real, you know, that, that, that realism, um, neorealism, I guess is what you're calling it. But I think, um, you know, I think it's, it, it was this mich mishmash of the two genres in that way. So if you can imagine the Florida project and then a film like man who fell to earth or even right. Under the skin with this sort of like ominous, weird texture, creepy kind of stuff, but yet there's also something sort of, um, uh, whimsical about it in moments. And it is this kind of romantic teen, love interest but yet it is ominous and sort of scary but but um that's what makes it maybe seductive you know in a way oh, exactly so, yeah, yeah yeah so yeah lot, lots of different things that all and close encounters of the third kind even with the dad character sort of um going into a mania with you know um yeah I think sometimes when I watch it, I get different flavors of it too. I have to watch it, you know, obviously a lot of times in the edit when I'm fine tuning sound and that kind of thing. And every time I watch it I'm like, oh this kind of reminds me of this film today there that scene reminds me of this part or whatever, but um, yeah, lots, lots, lots in the stew for sure. One of the things that Kirby did that I think was really interesting. And I think you might be able to, to pull this from him just by listening to him now is that he's very auditory. <laughs> a lot of, uh, you know, sound is a big thing. And, um, you know, I mentioned uh, under the skin, the, I mean, the sound design and music in that movie if you've seen it, is really something. And early on what he, did that I thought was interesting is when he sent me the script, he sent me a lot of sounds and music to listen to while I read it. And it informed me in a really, really interesting way. It really informed me. It just, it just told me a lot about what I just like, ah, I get it. I get it. I get what this thing is, you know, by the sounds. I thought that was a really interesting thing. And he uses it quite a bit and you'll see when we see. The That's wild. Yeah. I think the film is like 70% sonic you know, and 30% and visual. Um, for me, you know, when, when I shoot something, I'm, I'm obsessed with what sound is going to go with it. So it's almost like I shoot images just wanting to then make the sound design of like, you know, when you shoot a factory where the dad is working, you know, like the sound what do these big humming machines sound like on an overcast day with the wind, you know, blowing dust across rocks and then the freeway in the distance and that kind of thing that, that almost sounds like an alien landscape too. And, and you know, there, there, there's corners of our world that sound like sci-fi movie. You know, if you look at like Blade Runner and stuff, uh, you know, there's so many sounds that people pull from just weird machines and, and record it in a way where you focus on different aspects of our everyday reality. But when taken out of context and put in a different way, it does sound like this weird ambient alien kind of, uh, you know, world. Now for Kate and Tyler, how did sort of that dynamic 
affect what you brought to the screen because i mean like we see in the film like it's there are familiar elements but you're doing it like it's all coming across in such a unique and sort of like like we've been saying ethereal otherworldly different way how did sort of that dynamic affect your performances as you're trying to sort of get into the into the moment of it all i think for august like she in this she walks the line between the supernatural and the natural like she her world is both of that so um when i first got the script kirby sent me a lot of movies to watch um and like one of them was sissy space deck in badlands and um I got a lot of inspiration from that because she's going on this journey where she's with somebody new, but it's also so grounded. And so I tried to, um, when I was going about this, I tried to stay as grounded as I could in those scenes with Tyler to try to you know, make it feel more real and make it seem, because to her it is super real and it is real in the, in the script. And so trying right. to keep it level and um, th- like right there with the audience. Um, I guess uh, for me, I, I try to, you know, just keep the stakes of, I guess, our journey high because I know just to keep that, I guess, that difference in the film, you know, try to just not try to just be so, I guess, as Kirby said, just so distant from the reality of the situation, you know, right. just continuously just trying to pull August in the direction of this really weird journey that I'm taking her on while she's also being roped back into her family. So I guess for my character, I just wanted to go in with a clean slate, Um, you know, just really try to build this character from the ground up because a lot of it was just so much in the head, you know, for me, I guess just being that character because I didn't, you know, the clothes I was wearing, the style of the character, like that spoke for itself. I didn't really need to do anything for the design. It was more just what I was presenting. Um, so just trying to come at it with the aspect of just, I wouldn't say being aloof, but just being so otherworldly is what right. I focused on. Right. Now, I mean, just to start putting a bow on this, this is a silly question, but it's always something I like to ask uh, for all of you. Like, can you think back and, and pick sort of the moment or the movie that you saw in your lives that made you want to get into this business, be it as an actor or as a storyteller? Oh man. That's, I can answer that right off the bat. You go first, Cam. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Um, I, when I was a kid, my, my folks were pretty protective of me as far as, uh, uh violent movies. And I, my dad wouldn't even let me have a toy gun. He was, it was that kind of a thing. Uh, so I saw the deer hunter Oh wow! <laughs> at, okay. at a friend's house on a VHS tape. And, uh, there's one more film too, but this was slightly more impactful. So the, the, the scene in Vietnam where they're playing Russian roulette with it. Right. Camera, I was just, I've never seen anything like it. I really, I just didn't know that acting could be that. I, I just, it really jarred me. It really yeah. jarred me. It was the, the reality of it jarred. Me. I'll never forget it. And I just thought, and then the other one was uh, Dog Day Afternoon, which I just saw like on Showtime as a kid or something. And I, yeah. I just, again, I've never seen anything like it. And, and I just thought these people that do this thing, are, there's something really special about them there's something special about them and uh, i was fascinated with it and um that was that was a big those two were really big for me i would say from tyler yeah oh yeah go ahead tyler yeah oh um i guess for me um it was i don't even know as it wouldn't be like a particular movie nor a show but it was more just doing um my first uh theater just my first play nice um in college and Mm -hmm. I played a lot of sports growing up. So like, I never, I always felt like physicality was like the outlet for like emotion. Like, you know, right. I'm mad, I'm gonna, you know, go hit somebody playing football or I'm gonna, you know, do some, <laughs> like always like, I guess finding an outlet through sports or other means, not through actual like expression of like art. Cause like, um, I was, I played a little like instruments here and there, but like, I think I really just found love in just seeing that actors, they're so okay with themselves of doing, like, of being anybody. And, like, to me, that's such a lovely thing to where, like, you can just be so okay with yourself that you can play this character who might be a terrible person, who might, you know, be doing terrible acts. But seeing that people, you can really move somebody just through being a character. So that was just how I fell in love with it. Growing up for me, we, my family, we love to watch movies. Um, but I think the movie for me that 
kind of made me stop and be like, oh my God, that like, that's a movie it was when I watched Moonlight. Cause I just, I was blown away and I was just like, like that's cinema. Like that was amazing. Sure. And just the acting and just how it looked, it was, it was beautiful. That's awesome. I think for me, uh, you know, I, I came of age or as like when I was Kate's age as a character in the film, when I was like 16 was the late nineties, early two thousands. So that was this kind of amazing period of Requiem for a Dream, Fight Club, The Matrix, and even The Beach by Danny Boyle, which people love to hate on, but I think it's one of my favorite films actually. Um, so I love these kind of psychological horror, but it's uh, there's something that's kind of beautiful and seductive about it. So I'm really inspired by, you know, films from yeah, 1998 to 2001 <laughs> and everything in there, but then also, you know, films from Nicholas Roeg, like uh, Walkabout and The Man Who Fell to the Earth and that kind of thing. But uh, yeah, I'm a late nineties, early two thousands kid. So that era in cinema is definitely uh, my, my, I'm, my with you, I'm with you on the beach, man. That movie, that movie does not get a fair rap. <laughs> I know. And I don't know why. I don't know. I think it's because it was like Leonardo DiCaprio's first sort of big role after Titanic. So yeah. people were still associating him with that kind of, you know, pretty boy kind of thing. And, and then, you know, in Danny Boyle's film, he plays a much more dynamic kind of character, even though in Titanic, he was quite dynamic as well. But um, uh, yeah, people just love to hate on him as being like a too, too good looking and, and too uh, whatever, too, too mainstream. But I think The Beach is one of my favorite films, actually. Well, you know what, guy? I love that word dynamic because I think that really describes Spaghetti Junction because it's, it's a reminder of what indie cinema can do. And especially in these days when we tend to forget about that, that there's really some fantastic places that filmmakers like yourself and actors can go with a story like this. And I absolutely loved it. And just congratulations on the film. Thanks for the time to you all. And, uh, you know, I hope, I yeah. wish you all the success. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. And if you get a chance, uh, Austin Film Festival, 10 PM on Saturday, October 23rd, come check out the film. If you have that's to be right. Around absolutely. Town. Or check it out online. Cause it's streaming as well. For sure. So, Thanks again, everyone. And uh, good luck on so uh, Saturday. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Thanks so much. All right, bye, guys. Take care. And don't forget to, to visit our friends over at Bay Street Video for all your DVD, Blu-ray rental, or purchasing needs this summer, as they are still open for curbside and some mailing delivery as well. Over at 1172 Bay Street, Toronto, Ontario, Canada, you can give them a call at 416-964-9088. That's 416-964-9088. Or send them an email at baystreetvideoto at gmail.com for any of your DVD and Blu-ray needs.